بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ما بعد So tonight inshallah we move to the next section of Al-Durus Al-Muhammah Li'amat Al-Ummah The explanation of the important lessons for every Muslim And we finished the first section of the book or the first half of the book which was dedicated to Aqidah, the majority of it, or all of it, was surrounding Aqidah, and that's pretty much half of the explanation of the book. Now we move into the section uh, that is dealing with fiqh, the section that is under the chapter of the science of al-fiqh. Now, before we start talking about al-fiqh, does everyone know what fiqh is? Al-fiqh who? What is al-fiqh? Right Again, mm -hmm. of what? Yeah. Hmm. The breakdown of the different aspects of the religion. Tell you that could be Aqidah. Okay. What does fix specify or, or concentrate on? Sometimes it's translated as jurisprudence. Hmm. G, the law. Which law? The law is general. But which law are we talking about? Islamic law. Tayyip. Islamic law. Tayyip. Let's be more specific or simplify it, right? If you want to simplify it, knowledge, having knowledge of the halal and the haram. Tell you, everything we do has a ruling connected to it, right? Whether it's obligatory, haram, recommended, disliked, allowed, right? So... This is in summary, in summary, al-fiqh is having knowledge of these rulings. And it's important because everything we do has some type of hukum, some type of ruling connected to it. It's not restricted to, even though we're going to start with the salah, it starts with the salah. Well, it doesn't start with the salah, actually. But in here, in this book, he starts with the conditions, shurut al-salah. The conditions of the salah. And this is something that we don't have the, or we shouldn't take lightly because the salat is something we're doing every day. Salat yeah. al Day in and day out. So we don't have a time where we uh, have the, some type of option of not knowing these rules for our religion. We pray every day, with no days off when it comes to the prayer. So we need to know this information every day, on an everyday basis. This is on page 197. In the translation on page 197, the sixth lesson. So, the author, Rahimahullah, Sheikh bin Baz, Rahimahullah, he says, Adar Sassadis, Shurut al Salat, Shurut al Salat, Wahia Tis'a. He says, The conditions for the prayer are nine. Nine conditions for the prayer. Tayyip, firstly, sometimes you read a book, you find in a book, sometimes it says there are nine. And sometimes it says there are six. 
Some books you read it will say six conditions for the salat, for the prayer. And another book you might see, it may say there are nine conditions for the prayer. And he's going to get to that. We'll get to that in a minute. So he says there's six. And then he lists the, what those conditions are. Now, generally, uh, we should know, if we don't, the importance of the salat. How important is the salat? It's so important that the salat is a pillar. It's the second pillar. Most important pillar after the shahada. The Prophet told us in another hadith that the first thing that a person would be questioned about from their actions on the day of judgment is the salat. Is the salat. Uh, this is an issue of Islam, a person's belief. Is a person a Muslim or, or, or a person is not a Muslim based on if they pray or if they don't? Right. And the whole discussion surrounding that amongst the scholars of Islam, if a person doesn't pray, are they still considered a Muslim? And we don't find that discussion around other uh, actions from the slaves, from other actions of worship. And that's a big issue. It's a big issue for the person who doesn't pray. Are they Muslim? Are they still considered to be Muslim? Uh, how many prayers do they have to miss in order for them? based on the, the statement of the Prophet that between us and them, meaning those who disbelieve in the Lord's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi is the Salat. So, men kafa. so whoever abandoned the prayer, then they have disbelieved. Now the question is, what is abandonment of the prayer? How many prayers does a person have to uh, miss intentionally, not intentionally, out of laziness? It's a whole discussion. But the point being is that's how important the Salat is, is that discussion surrounds it. Which shows us it should tell us uh, it's not an optional. And even a salat has a ruling connected to it. Right? There's a hukum connected to the salat. What's the ruling on the salat? Obligatory. obligatory. Are all salawat obligatory? G. But we know the five prayers, the five daily prayers are obligatory, not optional. So after clean clarifying the uh, the belief system and the aqidah and what we're supposed to believe and how we believe in Allah and His Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as Sheikh Abdul Razak says, he says, nextly, awwal furud al-Islam, the first obligation on the person who becomes a Muslim is that what a person takes shahada and immediately, it's no it's no grace period between when a person has to begin start praying. Does that mean that the, the new Muslim who just took shahada knows everything and what to say in a prayer? It doesn't mean that. But the fact that a person became Muslim today or yesterday, does that mean they have the option of not praying? No, they don't have the option of not praying. So if they still have the obligation of praying. Uh, it may be some different things or different excuses that they have on not saying certain things that they don't know, but the option of just not praying in totality, that a person just took shahada, they just became a Muslim so they could say, well, I just became a Muslim and I don't know the prayer, so I'm not going to pray at all. That's not an option. That's not an option. Uh, and here he says, لا يستقيم الدين المسلم ولا تصل أعماله ولا يعتدل سلوكه this uh, whole statement is important. Which is at the top of page 198. The first obligation of Islam is a salat. Is the last thing abandoned from the religion towards the end of time. The religion of the Muslim will not be established because many times we wonder, we wonder why we're having problems in our deen. Right? Uh, the second pillar of our entire deen is the salat. He says, the religion of the Muslim will not be established. His actions will not be correct in his methodology and the affairs of his worldly life and religion will not be balanced until he establishes the prayer upon the prescribed manner in terms of aqidah, worship, and following the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is super important. That the salat brings balance to our lives. And if we're not praying, 
many of us think that we're owed something, as if Allah owes us something. So if we're not praying, how do we expect for things to go smooth in our lives in general? If we're abandoning a pillar, a pillar, not something optional, a pillar. He says, in terms of Aqidah and everything that we, the whole first section of the book spoke about Aqidah, the belief or what the Shahada means, right? Being sincere, having love for Allah, being true for all of those things that cover the, the conditions of the Shahada and following the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, praying as we have been taught to pray by the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. Tayyib. This is not, and it doesn't happen just by accident, but it takes knowledge. We have to learn these things. We have to learn how the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam pray in order that we can pray the way our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us to pray. And this is a sidebar, sisters. I hope we understand, sisters and brothers. I hope everybody understands in a statement like this where it says, the religion of the Muslim will not be established and it says his actions will not be correct. I hope we understand that this means her actions will not be correct. This is not just the men have to do this. This is for the Muslims. Because a male uh, pronoun is used, doesn't negate the women. Uh, that's just a side note. That the women, the sisters, our sisters are not excluded from these things. So... He mentions a very important distinction coming up, y'all. In this section here, and these issues here are very important. It's connected to the pillar. It's connected to the second pillar, right? We have to remember it's connected to the pillar. It's connected to that thing that the Prophet Sallallahu said. The first thing that a slave will be asked about their actions, Yom Al-Qiyam, will be their prayer. Tayyip. He starts off, as Sheikh says, وَقَدَّمَ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهِ الْكَلَامِ عَلَى الشُّرُوطِ أَنَّهَا تَسْبِقُ الصَّلَاةِ He starts off with the conditions, because the conditions come before the prayer. Conditions come before the prayer. The conditions are not necessarily a part of the actual salah. Everybody clear? Conditions are before we even stand up to pray. There's certain things that have to be done, certain things that have to be in order before we even stand to pray. These things are not necessarily a part of the prayer. These things are not necessarily a part of the prayer. He says, This is in preparation. The things, the conditions are in preparation for the salat. Before we even say Allahu Akbar. Because the takbir, Allahu Akbar, starts the salah. Before we even get there, is how many things that have to be in place? Yes, sir. I did say six. Did I? Some, some say six, some say nine. Some say six, some say nine. These are the conditions, right? Before we even say Allahu Akbar, according to the author on the according to the author, there have to be nine things have to be in place. Now, why is it nine and nine? Why is it six? We'll get to. Tayyip, he said, these are in preparation for the prayer. This is in the middle of page 198, y'all, where it says the Sheikh began with the conditions of the prayer. Tayyip, uh, he says, after that, after that, he says, After the section of the conditions, he's going to move to the pillars of the prayer. Why are the pillars important? The pillars of the prayer are actually a part of the actual prayer. They're part of the salat. The conditions are what? Not a part of the prayer. The pillars are a part of the prayer. That's one difference between the two. There's a difference between conditions and pillars. He says, He says, and he put the pillars, so they, they come in order. First, we have conditions, and then he moves to the pillars of the prayer, and he moves to the wajibat, which are called obligations of the prayer, which uh, sometimes it can be confusing. Some people get confused.
refuse. If it's obligatory, then that means what? You have to do it. But the the meaning that it carries when it comes to these issues is a little more technical than to say obligation is something we have to do. Like if we use that word like that, have to do, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of ways that could be understood. Like, but anyway, he says, because they are the wajibat, the obligations, they are great. They are a great part of the prayer. Obligations are serious. They're the third level, though, if you look at it. The first level is what? The conditions. And then the pillars. And then the obligations. But the obligations are serious. Obligations are a serious thing. He says, this is an issue of, and it's a whole section about this. But before that section, we have to understand the difference between a pillar of the prayer. It can, uh, uh, I'm sorry, start from the beginning. We have to understand what a condition is, what a pillar is, and what a what an obligation is when it comes to the salat. And they all have a separate section. So in this section, he's summarized the difference between the two without going into much detail, but it's important to understand. So he says here, the rukn, the rukn, the rukn is the pillar. That the pillar, that the salat is invalid if a person doesn't fulfill the pillar. Clear? We're not talking about the conditions now. We're talking about the pillar. Okay? But a person, if they don't, if they miss a pillar, then the salat is invalid. An example of the pillar of the salat is what? Al-Fatiha, recitation of Al-Fatiha. What does that mean? If a person stands to pray and they don't recite Al-Fatiha, that means they missed what? A pillar. And if you miss a pillar, then the salat is invalid. It doesn't count. Clear? Tell you? After that, he says, But the obligatory thing, the thing that we say is an obligation, if it's missed, if you miss an obligation, then you have to do what is considered the to prostrate for, for, uh, for forgetfulness at the end of the salat. Now, what's the difference between the two? He says after that, he goes back to the pillar. We have a pillar and a, a pillar and a Obligation. So, yeah. Let's say, for example, give two examples to make it clear, and then hopefully the text will be clear. A person stands to recite to pray the salat and they don't recite al fatiha, which is just one of one of the pillars. So, yeah, they don't recite al fatiha, which means that that salat is what is invalid without al fatiha. There's no salat without al fatiha, as the Prophet said. That salat lam kitab. So what happens in that case? Let's just say, for example, they stand to pray Salat al-Isha. They say, Allahu Akbar. They say the opening dua for the Salat. And possibly, possibly something happens and they get distracted, right? And they never recite Al-Fatiha. They skip and they say, Qul huwa Allahu Ahad, Allahu Samad, lam yalid wa lam yulad, to the end of the, the, the surah. Then they say, Allahu Akbar, and then they go into Rukur. Uh, they come back up how many finish though they go through the salat like that right they finish they get to the last rakah and then they end the salat and they salam out what's the hukum on that salat what's the rule on that salat the salat is not valid why they missed the pillar they missed the pillar where in the beginning the first rakah the first rock out, what was the pillar they missed? Al Fatiha. Clear? Same situation, y'all. They do the same thing. And when they get to the second rock out or the third rock out, they remember that they didn't recite Al Fatiha in the first rock. Everybody with me? I'm praying Salat al Isha. I say Allahu Akbar. I say my dua. The door slams. 
throw me off. I start reciting Qudhu Allahu Ahad, Allahu Samad. I skipped what? Skipped Al Fatiha, which is a pillar. Tayyip, I recite uh, Surah Al Ikhlas. I go into the Ruku, I come up, do the whole rakah. I stand in the second rakah, I start reciting Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. And I remember to myself that what? I didn't recite Al Fatiha in the first rakah. Clear? Tayyip, what happens in this case? Huh? The first rakah didn't didn't count. Clear? First rakah doesn't count. There's a couple ways this can go, y'all. And why are we discussing? Because it happens a lot. Sometimes you come into the salat late, you rush and you think about something. You do something, you forget to do something. You got to know how to fix it. It's the salat. It's not something I'm going to just do it like this, man. Inshallah. <laughs> we can't do this. No, 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 no. We have a way. It's a way to fix it. We just got to learn a way to fix it. So that means that in that case, the second rakah, in that case, we'll be replacing the first one where I didn't recite al fatiha Clear? Let's say same situation. Y'all with me, sisters? Let's say same situation. I do the takbir, Allahu Akbar. Same thing. A door slams or something happens. It throws me off and I start reciting. So the That I will have to go back and complete it for that rakah. There's a couple ways. There's a couple ways it can happen. That's why I mentioned the different scenarios. There's a couple things that can happen. I could remember that I skipped Al Fatiha while in the Sajda in the same rakah, possibly. I could remember that I skipped Al Fatiha in the second or third rakah. I miss. I forgot. I, once I get to the third rakah or the fourth, I say, Yo, the first rakah I never said Al Fatiha. That's possible. I could salam out. After the salat is over and done, you understand what happened? What has to happen? In order for you to correct the prayer, when you miss a pillar, you have to come with the pillar. There's no way you can say, for example, for example, there's no way you can skip al-fatiha in the first rakah. And then you just end the salat and you say, you know what, I'm going to just do the two sujuds at the end because I forgot to pray. I forgot to recite al-fatiha. You understand? Not for a pillar, y'all. And that's going to come in detail later. Clear? It's going to come again. This is going to come again. And that's why he says here, he says in that paragraph, it says, as for the Rukin, uh, as for the pillar, whenever you miss a pillar, you have to come with the pillar. The pillar has to be done. All right. And there's a section coming up for that. Uh, and that's why it says here in that paragraph, y'all, as for the pillars, then nothing can take their place. It is a must that each pillar is performed. You can't just say, I missed out fact. Excuse me, I missed that fatty on the first rock. I'm going to just do the two sujuds at the end. And alhamdulillah. No, 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 no. Not for a pillar. For a pillar, you got to go back and fix it. Tayyip, what about an obligation? This is the difference, y'all. An obligation, you don't necessarily have to go back and fix it. But at the end, you have to do the two sujuds. Uh, so the two prostrations for forgetfulness. Clear? And they're going to come again. 
He just mentioned it very briefly here. The point of mentioning it is that there's a difference between the two. Either one, if you leave them off intentionally, you're going to invalidate your prayer. You can need, you can never leave them off. I'm just not going to recite al Fatih. I'm in a rush. They get ready to give me a ticket, so I'm going to just recite a short sore, and I'm going to skip this. All right? A person who intentionally leaves them, they're going to invalidate the prayer. Whether it's a pillar or, or something as an obligation. Clear? Don't worry about it, y'all, because it's a section coming up specifically for the pillars, and it's a section coming up specifically for the obligations. So we'll come back to it again. But just to understand, that sentence there is referring to the difference between the two. Okay? We, we'll do it again when we get to the pillars. Tell you, he says the shot that we're talking about today, the condition that we're talking about today, which is the prerequisite or the thing that has to be done before we can even pray, before we even pray, because the conditions are not part of the prayer. Right? What's an example of the conditions of a salah? An example. Wudu, making wudu. Making wudu is not from the salah. It's not a part of the prayer. But this is before we even get to pray that a person has to be in wudu. Tell you, the scholars define a pillar, and this is a technical definition. It says, I'm going to read this. I just want you to, you know, tell you. It says the condition of the prayer, of the prayer, a condition, according to the scholars, is that which the act of worship is invalid without. But if it is present, it does not necessitate that the act of worship must be performed. Clear? It says a condition, according to the scholars, is that which the act of worship is invalid without. But if it is present, it does not necessitate that the act of worship must be performed. For example, clear? For example, wudu is a condition of the prayer. So the prayer is not correct if it is not present. And whosoever prays without wudu has no prayer. But, and he goes on, if a person is in a state of wudu, it doesn't make it necessary for that person to pray. Oh. <laughs> Makes sense. But here, the point is, y'all, what's the point of reading it? These are technical definitions to make sure that we clear and that nothing that scholars, the, the goal is to make it, as they say, the definition wants to be jammy on manium. They want to make a clear, concise definition where nothing is left out that's should be in there and you don't put anything in there that's supposed to, that's not supposed to be in there. So what happens? Just because a person has wudu, y'all, doesn't mean that they're making salah. Right? We can be all we can all be sitting in wudu for all night long. It doesn't mean we're necessarily praying. Right? And at the same time, a person, a person cannot pray without wudu. Right? So what's the condition? The condition is as they say, they define it that is it, it, it necessitates that if the condition is not there, then the thing that you the condition is for is not there. If wudu is not there, there is no salah. Clear? If the wudu is not there, there's no salah. This is the condition. Right? And the fact that you're in wudu doesn't mean you're necessarily praying. Yes. Clear? It's possible to be in wudu for hours at a time. We all know that, right? We can be in wudu for hours and not necessarily praying. But when it's time to pray, when it's time to pray, we know that we have to be in wudu. Yes. So hey, it's the time you make wudu, not necessarily for the salat, but for something else. Like what? For reading the mushaf, J. Reciting the mushaf, touching. I tell you, for touching the mushaf, jayi. That a person makes wudu because they want to go touch the mushaf. We stop there. I tell you, so it's possible, it's possible that a person makes wudu for something other than the salat, right? Everybody get the point of a condition? It's possible that the condition is there, but it doesn't necessitate because the, the thing is. Filled. Because you have wudu, it doesn't mean you are praying. 
But if you are praying, then what? You must be in wudu. You have to have wudu. Clear? Tell you. And that's that. Uh, this is the, the, the details of the conditions. Now, he moves on to the conditions. And he says there are nine. The first three, y'all, uh, which is al-shat al-awwal, which is al-islam. Why do some books have nine conditions and some books only mention six conditions? This is because the first three conditions are conditions not just for the salat, but for every act of worship. In order for every act of worship to be valid, the first three conditions have to be met. The other six are specific for the salat. The first three that he mentions are what? For all acts of worship. Clear? Also, we have two sets of conditions. We have conditions that are conditions for something to be valid, meaning without this thing, it's not valid. So without the salat, I'm sorry, without the wudu, the salat is not valid. You're going to have to pray over it, right? That salat didn't count. Let me say that. No, they don't count. You got to pray again. Right. Type. So you have some conditions that are conditions for something to be valid. And then you have something, con some conditions that are conditions for something to be obligatory on a person. Some conditions are for validity, the validity of something. And some conditions are for an obligation on a person. Method, for example. When is the salat obligatory on a person? Once they reach puberty and the other conditions that go along with, right? But those things are not necessarily what make the salat valid. A person could have reached puberty, they've been in their same mind, they're a Muslim. And with those three, that means they have to pray. That means the salat is obligatory on them at that point. But it doesn't mean when they pray that their salat is valid, they could miss another condition. They might have all of these things and then they made wudu incorrectly. They did all these things and they didn't fulfill another condition. Clear? Thought you? So the first three goes back to the point. Sometimes, because you might pick up another book and it says there's conditions for Salat are six. And they won't mention the first one, which is al Islam, that a person has to be a Muslim. They won't mention uh, the second one, that a person has to have their aqal in their same mind. And they won't mention a Tamiz, that a person has reached the age of a Tamiz. I'm going to see how he translated that when we get to it. Everybody clear? So it's possible, y'all, don't leave and say, well, you said nine, let's say six. No, it's a reason for it. Tell you, it's a reason for it. Discernment. I think the explanation is probably a little more clear than the word itself once we get there. Tell you, so the first condition as he says, is al-Islam. وَذَلَكَ لِأَنَّ غَيْرُ الْمُسْلِمُ وَالْكَافِرُ عَمَلُهُ بَعْضِلْ وَحَابِتْ غَيْرُ مَقْبُولُ That a person, in order for the salat to be valid, they have to be a Muslim. طيب. What for the salat to be, is the, is the salat obligatory on non-Muslims? Hmm? Yes, no. That's the issue. That's an issue of discussion that we're not going to get into, but that's an issue, right? Do the other non-Muslims, do they have to pray Salah? We're not going to go in there now, but just know that it's an issue. we get to that maybe another time. Tell you, he says that, why? Because those actions, the actions of those who disbelieve in Allah and His Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, those actions are nullified uh, and they will not be accepted by Allah Jalla wa'ala. As Allah said in the Quran, وَمَنْ يَكْفُرْ بِالْإِيمَانِ فَقَدْ حَبِتَ عَمَلُهُ وَهُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ As Allah said in Surah Al-Ma'idah, and whoever disbelieves in Allah Jalla wa'ala, then فَقَدْ حَبِتَ عَمَلُهُ His actions have been destroyed, nullified, and in the hereafter, it will be from the losers. It will be from the losers in the hereafter. Um, and he mentions a few more ayat where Allah said, Well, I got the oh here, Ilaya, Ilaka, Wayla Ladin, and Kabilik, and Ashraf, and Layah, and Amaluk, Ulatakunanamil and Hasidin. 
uh, and this I came previously in the other section of uh, the Aqidah section that if you were to commit shirk, right? And who is Allah Taala talking to in this case? If you were to commit shirk, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even if our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah said, if you were to commit shirk, then all of your actions would be erased, nullified. They don't count. And you will be from the losers. And you will be from the losers. And that's the danger of a shirk, worshiping other than Allah. That's the danger of it, that it nullifies all of a person's actions. Tayyip. So with that being the case, the condition for the salat to be valid is that a person has to be what? A Muslim. Therefore, if a Muslim did pray a salat, if a Muslim prayed a salat, then the salat is what? Invalid. I'm sorry. Stop for law. If a non-Muslim, I'm sorry. If a non-Muslim prayed the salat, then the salat is invalid. Clear? There are other issues connected to this, y'all. It's a lot of stuff that can be connected to it, but it's not the time for that. But there are a lot of issues connected to it. We'll leave it like that. To, to keep the the, the, us, the point of the book. Uh, he says, Ashat the Thani al Aqlu. That a person is in this sane state of mind. That a person is sane. So therefore, it says being of sound mind. And this is the opposite of sound mind is insanity. Insanity is the loss of the intellect. The pen is lifted from the insane person. The pen is lifted. Do we know what this term means? Huh? Well, yes, the pen is lifted, meaning a person is not responsible for their actions before Allah. There's some people who have mental issues, right? They have intellectual disabilities, right? In that case, you say, well, the pen is lifted from this person, right? Meaning what? The obligations are lifted off of them. So, yes, they don't pray. They don't pray at five times a day. They don't fast on Ramadan. Yes. I was going to ask, um, what, is the first, what is the reason for them not having the same mind of a coma? They decided to intoxicate themselves. If a person, J, if a person intoxicates them, intoxicate themselves, if a person gets high, y'all, that doesn't put them in this category. Like it? That doesn't put them in this category. Uh, when a person inflicts the, the loss of their intellect on themselves, it doesn't put them in this category. Clear? Especially when it's something with haram. Something haram. And again, not responsible doesn't mean that a person, if they went to court, they wouldn't be held responsible, give some type of, be reprimanded. Right? They still might get reprimanded. Taken to court, they still might have some, face some consequences. But sinning, is it a sin? Will they be punished before law and the person doesn't have their their right state of mind, and that's the that that's the type of the that's how they are. That's they've always been like that, and that's the type of life they live. That's a, a separate situation. Clear? Just to be clear, I was gonna say the same thing. I was I was alluding to. I was gonna lose more like this my schizophrenic and then I take any medication. You know, the actions that they commit while they're not in the state of mind, those specific actions, will they be held accountable or just for not you know taking their pills or in this case drinking? Say that or not take any pills. Yeah, you know, but yeah, some 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 patients they won't take they won't take they don't want to take their pills and then they, they won't be in the right mm. mind. You know, they might do something that you know they regret later on. That time or whatever. Will they be held accountable for the actions that they commit while they're under the influence or in the time of their mind? This is important. Everybody's not on the same level. Number one. Everybody who, let's just use the term, the pen is lifted, who's not accountable, not on the same level. Number two, that's a question, or the, how do we qualify that they are, that they have reached that level? That's a doctor's call. That's not like a sheikh. The sheikh says, well, you, it's a doctor call. The sheikh is going to say, well, what did the doctor say? Did you get a medical analysis? You understand what I'm saying? I don't know. I can't give a medical analysis of a person who's like that. We have general, we have general ideas that when we see certain characteristics to us we assume that a person right doesn't is not in their right state of mind that they have an issue somewhere right that's our assumption um 
it all depends on the situation. It all depends on the situation. It's possible that Allahu Allah. Allah, Allah. But it depends on the situation. That they leave a person who's not stable. That they leave a person who's not stable to be responsible for taking the medicine that makes them stable. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it re it varies from person. It's not like a one one paint brush you can pay. It's going to vary because the levels are going to vary. Thayyip. Thayyip. So this person also. Uh, that the salat from this person is not is not valid. It's not obligatory on them, and it's not valid. It's not valid. Why wouldn't the salat from a person who's not in their right state of mind be valid? Hmm. Anything else? It won't be. <laughs> They won't be able to uh, evaluate if they met all the conditions. J.E. Pillars, etc. One thing specifically. For sure. More important than that. Intention. Intention. Mm -hmm. How does the person in their wife say, how do they layak al niya, as they say? They're not even able to formulate and make the niya for the ibadah. You with me? Uh, and that fits the case for number two, and it fits the case for uh, number three. Number three, which is a shot of thala at tamiz. At tamiz, does anybody know what this word means? No. <laughs> yeah. Discernment. That's what it says in the book. No, what does the word discernment mean? That's the no, that's the meaning of the the whole thing. But you know, it's important to when we come across some words that we don't know like that, we should look them up in English just to make sure. What does it say? Judgment. I'll tell you, judgment. The age of judgment. When you put it together, it makes sense with the explanation that comes with it. It says in Yakumu Meizen that a person, a child, is able to judge generally between what's right and what's wrong. Were they 100%? Maybe not their kids. All right. So he says, that a child reaches that age when they hit the age of seven. By the age of seven, that they have reached a level mentally, mentally, to be able to. Okay, I shouldn't be doing this. I know I'm gonna get in trouble if I do. They have some type of right understanding of that. Tell you before the age of seven, because they say a condition, a condition for the salat is that they had to reach the age of tamiz, the age of seven. So if they reach the age of seven, they have their sanity and they're Muslim, then they can what? They can pray, right? Sahih? Y'all with me? Let's start from the beginning. The child is Muslim. He or she has, is in their right state of mind. He or she is eight years old. Can they pray? If they prayed, would their prayer be valid if they met the rest of the conditions? Clear? They met the rest of the assumption. They met all the conditions and they prayed the salat. Would they get rewarded for it? Alhamdulillah. Let's say the same child, Muslim, they have their sanity, and he or she is five years old. He or she is five years old. If they prayed, right, would the salat be valid from them? Yes. They met all other conditions. They met all other conditions. Yeah, yeah. So if they're five, then what's the difference between the five-year-old and the eight-year-old? What's the difference in the child who is five years old and what's the difference in the child that is eight? How are they different? Ah, oh, gee, now we get them. So the, the seven, the eight-year-old, the, 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 the assumption is the eight-year-old has what? 
that a judgment which leads to means they're able to form an intention for the salah. Whereas the five-year-old has not reached that age of judgment. Therefore, they're not able to form the intention for the salah. Clear? Therefore, the one that's under the age of seven, if they did pray, it wouldn't count. It's cute and all, y'all. It's nice to see him praying. And we should do that. We're talking about leading a grown-ups. Because sometimes people want to lead. The, the, they want to put the child four, five. And they want them to lead grown adults, men and women, who the salat is obligatory on. And they want the child who the salat is not obligatory on. And some of the children, if they pray, right, they pray without an intention. They want that, pe that person who prayed without an intention to lead people behind them. You see the problem? Yes. Because you can't think one brother and say all five years old, all five years old, all five year olds mm. are uh, all, all over level, and then every eight year old is above every five year old. Sahih. But in this case, how do we get to say seven is the age anyway? Mm. What? Oh, what, uh, what's the idea? Huh? Ah, and this is what the scholars use. The fact that he said seven, he specified the age of seven. Teach him at seven, which means they that's they this is what they use as a delil to say, okay, by seven they should be able to form the intention. He didn't say teach him at five. He specified, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Teach him at seven and by ten, if they're not praying, as they say. <laughs> all right, tighten them up as we say. <laughs> tighten them up is not abuse, y'all. Because sometimes we go left crazy. We mad because a two-year-old won't stand in the line and pray. A two-year-old. We mad because a five-year-old lines up. We line him up to pray with us. Soon as we say Allahu Akbar, he run off. And we upset. Screaming, yanking him up. Embarrassing me at the man <laughs> <laughs> they, they Number one, number one, it's not obligatory on them to pray, number one. They're not obliged to pray until when? Until puberty, they got right. Number two, that five year old, even if they pray according to what we, you understand? So, not that we shouldn't be teaching them, but we shouldn't be going overboard and disciplining them, right? The overboard, we can't go overboard in the discipline of a person who the, the, the deed itself is not even, they don't even, it's not obligatory on number one. It's not like they're leaving off an obligation. And number two, they at a level at that point where. It's just a teaching stage. It's more or less teaching stage. And if we got kids, if we got kids, you know, kids, you got to tell them the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over. So they leave your house. You be telling them the same thing. Tell you. So you see the difference? And that's how we get to say seven. All seven year olds, have they reached it? Like you said, they vary. But what do we have to say? No, you're at seven or you're eight. And you no, nah, you haven't reached. We don't have anything to say that unless. Unless we have something from a doctor where we can use the other excuse that what? That the pen is lifted from him. Right? So the age of Tamiz, and they use that exact hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and as he mentions here, I hope he mentioned it here, because this is important too. That hadith in the middle of page 201, y'all, where it says, command your children to pray at the age of seven, Beat them if you do not if they do not do it at the age of ten. Tell you, so it's important to mention, but it's not mentioned here. It says here an explanation: It This includes our daughters and our sons, not just the sons. You know. Not just you tell the boy to pray and she can lay there and she doesn't have to pray. No, we should be teaching our children to pray. Whatever we're doing is Muslim, the Muslim. Islam is for, you know, we have Muslim men and Muslim women. When we start specifying that this is only for the man, then we need some to show that that's only for the man. Right? We know that certain things are restricted. That it's for the men. Right? Like what? What is something specific for the men? Islamically, huh? Colony of them, or more than that, leading a jama'ah in prayer. 
right? We don't have a woman doesn't come here. Our sister doesn't come here and lead us in the prayer, right? That's possible. If it's all sisters, she a sister leads them in the prayer. That's possible. That's a different situation. So about a situation like this, we come to the masjid for Salat al Jumma. Who gives the khutbah, men or women? Men. I saw a cartoon one time, and it had a picture. It was a cartoon showing why. Maybe I shouldn't. Never mind. <laughs> never mind. I think we all know the wisdom behind. Never mind. Tayyip. Tayyip. Point being, here he mentions that the command to tell the children to pray includes the girls and the boys. Right? It includes the girls and the boys. Tayyip. I hope that's clear so far. So those first three, y'all, those first three are connected to all worship. That means it's connected. Those first three are connected to fasting, right? And any other worship, and they specify in a specific situation that is really no, no hajj right now to mention it, but those three are connected to all worship. Now, the fourth one in our book, uh, this starts now the actual condition for the salat, specifically. These are now conditions specifically for the salat. So when you look in a book and it says six, it might not mention those first three. Because what's the assumption? We already know those three count for everything. So they might, the scholar, whoever wrote the book, might not mention it. They might start with uh, just the six. Tayyib, he says, Ashat al Rabi' Raf al Hadith. Raf al Hadith. Wal Hadith, Yatanawal al Hadith al Akbar, Wal Asgar. Tayyib. Being free of ritual impurity. What is ritual impurity? Huh? What is it says that's what it says right here. It says being free. The fourth condition is that we have to be free of ritual impurity. And then it goes into the details. But what is ritual impurity? Those are the those are the categories of ritual impurity. But what is ritual impurity? And had it. Hmm? Jay, you're not in a, let's say, you're not in a state to be able to pray. So you, your, your hadith. What does hadith mean? Hadith is a wasf. It's a, it's a description that we give to a person. That you can't see it on them though. You with me? If a brother or sister comes in here right now, how do you know by looking at them if they have wudu or not? All right? I mean, that wouldn't be what? Little what? Right? How do you know if they have wudu or not just by looking at them? They, they, you don't. You can't tell by looking at a person if they have wudu or not, if they're in the state of ritual impurity or not. So ritual impurity means they're not, as we say, I'm not in wudu. So if I'm not in wudu, I have to make wudu. So when I say I'm not in wudu, that means I'm ritually impure. I'm hadith. Everybody with me? Sisters, you clear? In order to pray, I have to remove that state of being ritually impure. I have to remove that. How do I remove that? How do I get rid of being, being not able to pray? If you can say that. At the least, I got to do what? At the least, one way, or let's just say one way, not at the least. One way I can remove it is by making move up. Even though, y'all, it's important, even though you can't see it, nobody would never know. If, I, if a person came in here right now and lined up to pray, we would never know if they were in Google or not. But Allah knows, and that would be on them. And that's why sometimes we line up to pray, and while we're praying, a brother or a sister, in the middle of the salat, they do what? Hey, walk off. I forgot I wasn't in Google. I got to go make Google, right? Which is fine. It's no problem with that. Point being is that the, the people on the outside, there's not something that's written on them that you can see if they're in wudu or not. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Does the same apply if like you're leading, you're leading, um, you're leading like sisters, you know, you can walk off and start to figure it out? If you're leading sisters in the salat and the imam is not in wudu, that's an issue, y'all. It's the khilaf. There's a way to fix that. It is a way to fix that. Whether it was sisters or brothers, it's a way to fix that. Well, the imam, it depends. He started the salat and he wasn't in wudu? Or in the salat, he has to break wudu? No, no, he started without. 
Or if he started the salah without wudu, then that's a, y'all not praying. <laughs> he don't have wudu, right? You praying with the imam is praying without wudu. You don't have wudu. How you praying without wudu? Hold on, hold on. You with me? It's a different situation if you're in the prayer. For example, I'm in the prayer and I have to nothing. I have to use the bathroom. Like I can't wait. You with me? The imam is in the prayer. He has to use the bathroom. He can't wait. For example, uh, there's a way to fix that. It's possible. It's a. All right, I'll say that. It's a lot of possibilities that could work. There's, there's a lot of ways that could go. Maybe the imam didn't start the salat with wudu. Maybe he started the salat with wudu, and while he was in the salat, he broke wudu while he was praying. Maybe he broke one while he was praying, so he broke his wudu, right? Or he's praying. He didn't break his wudu yet, but he feels like he's going to, and he wants to protect the people behind him. But we gotta do that somewhere else. That's gonna be his whole. <laughs> Point being, it's a way to do it. Yes. I won't get into details, but the first part when you said they start, they never start the salat mm. without wudu. So is that salat not started for everyone? Yeah. They follow the imam. But no one has salat. Nobody has salat. That's why the imam, the imam has a heavy burden on him. You're responsible for everybody praying behind you. That means your wudu needs to be perfect. That means your kira'a of what? Al Fatiha needs to be as possible, as perfect as possible. Because everybody's salat is on your shoulders. You're responsible for everybody behind you. And that's the benefit of knowing who's behind you in a salat. Right? How long to recite, how short to recite. Because everybody's behind you. Their whole sure is, you know what I'm saying? Everything is connected to the Imam. That's why the Imam is you can't pray in front of them, all of the rules that go for the Imam. Yes. <laughs> Like you said, if you're the imam, you started the salat without the wudu, and you remember, yeah, you salam out with you. This, what, what are you doing? I, still have I saw it was one of the imams at the Haram did that in Medina. It's on YouTube if you want to look at it. It takes with life, man. The Jonas, can you imagine leading the salat at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's masjid, and whatever happened, you have to stop and go make wudu and come back with all of those people behind you? You go, you go make wudu and come back and finish? Or I'm going to tell you what he did. Up? Look at it. Look at it. I'm going to tell you what he did. He said, Antadru <laughs> Daqiqa. And he walked off. He said, wait one minute. He walked <laughs> off because he got a camera on him. He walked off and the people were still behind him like this. And everybody started looking up like, what's going on? He walked off. He went made wudu, came back and said, so there is no salat if I don't have wudu and I'm an man. He said, wait one minute. You can turn if, if you don't have this, you can turn around and tell everybody, listen, I don't, I'm not a, I'm not a wudu, I don't make wudu, I'll be right back. So no salam or nothing, just stop. You're not a, you, you're not salam out of You never started. That's just a it's 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 humbling. Because it's a in reality, it's a it's a mistake from the imam, right? And you got all of the people behind you depending on you. And in reality, you miss something that everybody knows you can't. So you have to go. You, it ain't like you could just, I'm going to just act like I got it. No, 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 no. Everybody's salat is on your back. You got to stop and this is what happened. Which shows we human. We human. That's the imam of the haram in Medina. It's not like a, you know what I'm saying, leading the haram in the process of the message. We human, we make mistakes. We forget. We fall short. But things are fixable. I'm didn't know. <laughs> like, you know, no, no. He said he started Allahu Akbar. And he never started the recite. And before he started the recite, he leaned into the mic and said, wait one minute. And then he went and waited and came back and they started over. So you got music or you already in the salat. It would be the same thing. You ain't in the salat, bro. Reality. You're not in the salat. You don't have wudu. There is no salat without the wudu. So in reality, it would, it, would, it would be the same way as if you're praying behind the imam, right? And the imam is reciting and you remember while you're praying that you don't have wudu. What do you do? You just go. Now the imam, of course, he can turn around because in reality he can turn around and say and talk to the people. He's not in the salah. He's going to break the salah anyway, right? Just to give the people some clarity of what's going on, right? He can do that. There wouldn't be no harm in that. Tayyib. So rough al hadith. So in order to remove that description, as we say, I'm not in wudu. I either have to make wudu or I might have to make a ghusl, depending. And that's why it says, Al Hadith Yatanawalu Hadith al Akbar. There's a major type of impurity 
ritual impurities. And then there's a minor type of ritual impurity. Okay, there's a major type and a minor type. The major type needs a ghusl. So after intercourse, that a person has to make a ghusl in order to pray. A person can't have intercourse with their, with their spouse and then just get up, make wudu and pray. No, obligatory to make uh, a ghusl, the bath, the whole bath. You can't just make wudu after that. But if a person uses the bathroom right throughout the day, they pray fajr, they went to work, a lot of them working, they had to stop. They used the bathroom, right? They break wind, right? Then they broke wudu. At that case, you at work, you go in the bathroom, you make wudu, and then you can pray the next salat. So how do you remove that had that ritual impurity? If it's a small ritual impurity from using the bathroom, going to sleep, sleep breaks your wudu, y'all. Right? You go to sleep, you wake up, it breaks your wudu. Sleep breaks your wudu. <laughs> If you fall asleep, you wake up, <laughs> you got to make wudu. Now, if you had intercourse with your spouse, then you need more than a wudu. You need a ghusl. Yes. Even if, y'all, even if, even if, for the ghusl, even if uh, the two private areas touch, once they touch, the wudu is obligatory. Yeah. Somebody informed me of a narration where the parents were waiting for Fajr to come in. They were laying down. One of them was snoring. Mm. Yeah, he was snoring? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just saying. I don't know. This, have you heard this? I heard of the narration. I never heard him snoring. Okay. I'm not saying I, I've never heard him snoring. The narration, um, what did I say? If you sleep. Yeah. There's a difference. We know they were leaning like that. Some of them were leaning like that. Right? Sleep breaks your wudu. There's a type of what we say. What we say is, if I was nodded, right? I'm nodding. What's the difference? I'm nodding. You know how you was you sleep? No, I wasn't sleep. I heard everything you said. Right? You're nodding, right? but you're aware of what's going on. You can hear people talking and that kind of thing. It's not the same. The person that goes to sleep. And they wake up, right? You know if you were sleep or not. You know if you were sleep or not, right? Sometimes I'm looking at a person and I think they sleep. And then they start talking to you, right? You're like, I thought you were asleep, right? And sometimes a person is, they could be sitting up like that, they knocked out, right? It's a difference between being asleep and being, as we say, I don't really know the other word for it, but we, we say nodding. I was just nodding. <laughs> Dozing off might be better. <laughs> That sound like you're at work. And they court you sleeping. Yeah. Concept of like dozing off. It's, it's like it's like you're phasing into sleep and you're coming back out and you're phasing. It's like it dip, it like dip, dipping, like dipping, and jiggy. Okay. I, like once you enter that realm of actual sleep. Well, the difference. No, no, no. Because the difference is we got the hadith that allows us to use that window. The hadith of the Sahaba, not and not being told. That allows us to use that space. What is that? Well, the Sahaba, they were waiting for Isha, and they were like, as we say, dozing or not. They weren't asleep, laying down, knocked out, but they were not. And then they stood up to pray Isha, and they didn't go make wudu. And they weren't commanded to go make wudu, which means what? You think the Prophet someone will let them pray and with a, without wudu? So what's the window is? It's a doze where you're still conscious of what's going on around you, but it's not like a sleep when you lay down flat and you knocked out and you only know where you're at. You wake up, you don't know where you're at. <laughs> you wake up. <laughs> yeah, it's not that. You wake up and they say clock out. <laughs> it's not one of them. Isn't that kind of like you're still aware, like you said, like you're still aware of your yeah. still I read something like you still know where you at. Right. You go into a deep sleep, you kind of like, you know where you live, but you wake up like, yeah. kind of you know when you sleep or not. And that's on everybody because it's possible a person thinks you sleep and you're not. That's on you to be honest with yourself before long. It's the salat. It's not like it's a game. You're going to wake up and you're going to pray like that. So a person might say, they come like sometimes you come in the mesh as a brother laying down or you lean on the wall. It's time to pray. They call you then. And you say to the brother, yo, you got to make wudu. And he says, what? I wasn't asleep. Was All right, that's on him. In reality, that's on him. 
Was he asleep or not? It looked like he was asleep, but is everybody everybody who sits, y'all, against the wall with their eyes closed? Are they asleep to the point they broke their wudu Islamically? No. Whose call is that? That's their call. Now, sometimes, you know, we talk now, we're not talking about extreme cases where, you know. But what if, what if, if that's on him, at the end of the day, if you tell a person make wudu, you almost look at he was knocked out, man. I ain't. And they say, no, I will, let's, you're going to make, make them make wudu? That's on them. That's on them. It's a salat. You can't pray without wudu. So, event, like, ultimately, it's going to be on them. Tell you. So, the removal of the hadith that, uh, that ritual impurity is either by wudu or ghusl. Majority of the time, like throughout the day, majority of the time is with wudu. Because we have, as we're going to get to later, we're going to get to what breaks the wudu. What makes us, no, you broke your wudu, you have to make wudu again. He said, no, I made wudu for fajr. Yeah, but you went home, laid down with the sleep, woke up, went to the bathroom. Like you did multiple things that you have to make a new wudu in order to pray. You can't pray like that. All right, so we're going to get to the things that actually, as we say, break the wudu, right? So if I want to pray, I have to get in wudu, I have to go make a wudu, or possibly a ghusl if it was in a course. Tayyip. And of course, y'all, all of this is summarized. This is, you know, it's summarized. Tayyip. And he brings a hadith at the end of the chapter, or at the end of that condition, I think we'll stop on this one for the day, uh, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, La <laughs> That the, the prayer is not accepted if a person is not in a state of ritual purification. That a, a salat, the salat is not valid if the person is not in a state of uh, ritual purification. So if a person has to make wudu and they pray, the salat is what? Invalid. But what if, even though they're Muslim, they have their same state of mind, they're of age, they're adults, they're above the age, and they're doing everything, but they don't have wudu. Then that means what? The salat is invalid. So all of these things have to be kept. That is not like you can just do out of nine of them. You say, well, I cover four of them, so I should be good. No, no, no. They have to all be uh, filled or completed. Tayyip? Yes. Uh, we'll stop there unless there's any questions. So if a person, you know, like you saw, you saw uh, Sheikh started the salat, that's the salat. Remember, he didn't have wudu. Mm. But at that time, he was he didn't know that he was supposed to slam out. His, his judgment, he didn't know how to handle the situation. He figured, this is salat. Under his, his assumption, he thought, the salat counts for them, but I'll just go move my mouth. My, you know, I'll just let him out. Because he didn't know, you know, he didn't know. Nobody take over. He didn't know what the, the rule was. Everybody else. Does he have to go back and Tell them, like, well, remember four or five weeks ago, I mean, that's a lot. That's well, that's the problem on that, brothers. Brothers, that's our problem. That's all of us, all of us should see the importance of knowing the ahkam of the salat and the ahkam of being the imam, not just knowing the rules of the salat, the rules of being the imam. Everybody, all the brothers here, everybody here is an imam at some point. You're going to be the imam somewhere. You don't have to be imam here. When you leave out of here, you're going to be somewhere and you're going to be the imam of somebody else. You're going to be leading the prayer. We human. We forget stuff. We make mistakes. It has to be important to us to fix it. Knowing how to fix it. You dig what I'm saying? That's the imam's problem. There's a whole chapter about uh, how to be the imam, what to do and what not to do. So now the question, back to the question, that a brother, without knowing those rules about being the imam, Right? He never learned them. And now he's the imam. So he messed up. He he did something and now he's worried about the people still out behind him. So much That's a mess. I don't know. It's the it depends. You trying to say are, is their salat valid? No, well now you're saying it wasn't valid. So no, I'm asking, I'm making sure I'm understanding the question. Are you saying is the question, even though he knows his woo He's not in Wudu. Is the question, what about the people behind me? They should. So he thinks they should be cool. I'm just messed up. Is that what he thinks? Yeah. They can't be held accountable for. 
they can't be held accountable for. The followers can't be held accountable if the imam is not a wudu. No, but what does the imam do now? What are the matter? You heard that this is the case. It's a difference when it after the salat. That's that's an issue where the people behind them are not. The salat is over. Once they leave and they disperse, it's not really on them at that point. He still has to pray over. He might never see them people again. Well, well, if he does see him again, from what I know, from what I know, their salat is fine. But this is when the salat is over. There's a difference if you know in the salat, and there's a difference if, like, time wise, if you know in the salat, he knows he's not a wudu, right? And they know he's not a wudu. You with me? They prayed the whole prayer like that, and they left. Is it still on the, the people to pray over? I don't think so. Well, Allah, they know. Yeah, if they know, but if they don't know and they left, but he knew, but the people left. I don't think so. But Allah, they have that right. As long as they don't know he wasn't in the loop. Right. If they find out, if everybody sitting there finds out the man, the, the, the man wasn't in wudu, they got to pray over. But if it never comes up, I ain't know he was in wudu. How many people matches we go into, we pray behind people? We don't know anything about that. We don't know anything. I don't know. The, the assumption is the man has wudu. That's the assumption. He's the man. He's supposed to know better. Should he bring it up? If he's not in wudu? No, after it's my mom. Then he's not, and he's not in wudu? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Should he bring it up? He prayed a whole salat, not in wudu. All the people behind him don't know he doesn't have wudu. He turns around and lets him leave. He definitely should bring it up. If he's going to do that, he should have stopped in the middle of the salat. You with me? If he's going to turn around and say something after you prayed for Raqqa, he should have stopped when he found, when he realized he wasn't in wudu, stopped right there, and when it made wudu and came back. You dig what I'm saying? What would be the benefit of praying like that with no wudu? And that it's so deep, y'all, that some, if I'm not mistaken, it's Imam Shafi, or some of the scholars have even mentioned that to intentionally pray without a, 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 a uh, without a condition fulfilled, some of them have took it to the level of being disbelief. Oh. Serious, 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 serious. But you pray intentionally. You're going to pray intentionally without wudu? Some have went to that case, and it's a discussion. When you say bring it up, you mean like four or five minutes in the line, bring it up, or... Immediately after the salat, because those are two different things. Oh, with his question? Yeah. Uh, I'm not really just admitting you. It was me. <laughs> okay. I, I love this. I didn't know. I didn't know. That. You just, that's what I'm saying. You just People found, behind? Huh? You said you just found this out right now? Yeah. Then don't say there's no point. It's oh, if you just found out now, then you ain't nothing you do. You already left. But the proper thing to do would be to stop, make the loop. That's the proper I'm thing to do. Mm -hmm. Even if you went all the way through and you felt like if, if a person were to, were to tell them that would be an issue, we got to pray over. But we not like now I'm not saying it like there's no harm. y'all. I'm saying it's we human. There's no harm in being a human. There's no harm in being a human, meaning there's no harm. We forget. Like they're gonna refute like what are we gonna do? I forgot. I made a mistake. I'm human. You know what I'm saying? It's it's no harm in being human, but the fact that we're human don't mean we don't fix it and do it right. You know what I'm saying? It's the process them taught us how to fix things. So when we fall short and, and make the mistake and don't do things right, we just gotta know how to fix them. Inshallah. Um, I got a question. So there'll be times where like before the slide, um I'll be like, Yeah, I'll be like, Yeah, I'm cool. And then in the middle of the slot, I'll start thinking again, do I have to do or not? And then I'm like, you know, mm. that in itself, thinking about whether you have a living salat. And you're supposed to like, make any of that type of shit. In the salat? In the salat. The, the whisper of the shaitan? Are you even supposed to be thinking about what you have in the salat? The also is that you go with what's, what you're sure about. Right. It's not something that we got to go back and forth the whole salat if I got wudu or not. Do you have wudu or not? Yes, I have wudu. Now, if it comes to you while you're praying, because sometimes it happens, it comes to you while you're saying, you know what? That's just life. We human. 
Why are you praying? You remember? You know what? I did go to the bathroom before I left the house. And I was talking to such and such. Everything might run in your mind. Now the reality comes. You know what? I did break Google. Why are you praying? You stop. As far as going back and forth in the Salat, when you started the prayer, you started on certain, I'm certain I'm in Wudu. And that's what you go with. I made Wudu at such and such time. Why are you praying? The reality come overtakes you and say, yo, you know what? No, I did bring you sure, not you think. Because uh, certainty is not removed with doubt. That's a, a, a kind of principle. What you're certain about, doubt can't erase that. So once you're certain that you made Wudu, only thing that can remove that fact that you made wudu is that more certainty comes that you broke wudu. So you don't have to go back and forth. But I'll make, uh, that's nothing. Uh, you with me? The problem would be where that uncertainty comes. So now you're like, now you're about to reface your whole life. No, 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 no. It's not. We don't have to do that. We're not obliged to do that. That's the point. And that's the point of the principle. The qaeda is you go with what, you, what you're certain about. When I stand up to pray, I'm certain I'm in wudu. Cool, I pray. If it comes to while I'm praying, no, you, and you know for sure, it's sure, not doubt, not I think. Wait a minute, did I really? When I did that? No, no, no. We don't have to pay attention to that. Um, also, with that, isn't it only considered like, like, it could come to you in, in the salah, like, am I, like, isn't it supposed to be like, am I supposed to say it's scared or something? Mm. And it's like, in that sense, isn't it if you only hear it or it's not mm. like anything else you kind of just got to. Right. The hearing the smelling is, but with but see the hearing the smelling would be certain. That's the certainty that comes to let you know that you right. No, they're not the only two ways. Because it's possible. That's why you're praying. It's possible, right? That's if you're breaking it while you're praying. You heard something. Like, yeah, but it's possible while you're praying, you remember that you broke it before. You with me? Whenever the certainty comes that overrides what you thought you was on, that's what takes that's what takes over. So I started off, I was praying, I knew I was in Wudu. While I was praying, it came up, ah, that's right. Never mind. <laughs> Once that certainty comes, it removes that one, so you go with what's, what you're sure about. As far as going back and forth and having to debate yourself in the Salah, that's from the Shaitan. It's from the whisper of the Shaitan to throw your Khushu off. All right. I'm not sure that it's appropriate right now, but we mentioned the Father also. Mm. It's when that, uh, the right part Yes. What can we give a little more clarity on this? You know, what other scenarios, how, you know, like uh, other scenarios for yeah, Gosso? No, I say if your hands touch the heart part. That's Wudu. That breaks that Wudu. Yeah. Okay. For the Gosso, other scenarios that make it obligatory would make a Gosso. Intercourse, uh, even if the private parts touch with no ejaculation, with ejaculation requires a Gosso. Wet dream, intercourse with ejaculation, wet dream. Nocturnal admission with, with ejaculation, uh, when the private parts touch with or without ejaculation. The fact that they touch necessitates loss. And it's gonna come up. It's gonna that's another section. What breaks the wood? That's gonna come up again. Mm. Does foreplay require a whistle type say you always remarkable, you know, you commit foreplay, but you didn't ask the kid to you feel me? So with you oh the kid came or something happened. As long as the touch, as long as the, the private parts touch the whistle. Because I'm saying the private parts is because your hand is missing the doctor, your hand the foreplay more then the private part is gonna get there yet. Mm, so would that require a little You tell me. You tell me, y'all. This is what they do. The early man, they give you quiet and they give you the rule. This is the rule. You apply the rule. Okay. The the man, they, there's foreplay. The private parts didn't touch. Are they touching each other? Possibly. Tell you? Possibly. Now, the question is, does a man touching his wife or does a, a woman touching her husband in a foreplay manner? Does that break the rule? Tell you, yes. Tell you. Do they have to make whistle for that? No. Why don't they have to make hustle? When do we have to make hustle? When the private parts touch. Or ejaculation from foreplay. Okay. You with me? We get to that. We're going to get that. We're going to, no, it's going to come back up. It's going to come back up. It's a whole section of what breaks the woo-woo. And generally, generally, that comes a lot. I don't know why. But that section generally comes before the salah. 
like in the books of Fifth, they go through water and then they go through wudu. Oh, they go through uh, water, istinja, uh, the cups you can use, and wudu. And, and then they come with the salat because in reality, we make wudu and stuff first and then we go pray. So wudu and stuff usually comes before the salat, but Allah Alam Sheikh put the salat, the condition of salat first, and then the things, wudu and what breaks the wudu is going to come. So it's going to be a whole section on that. And we'll stop there, inshallah. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barakatuh. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barakatuh.